Thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Emmanuel Church. We are one church with multiple locations, and we believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're going to hear some practical teaching from God's Word that I believe will be inspiring and relevant to your life. First, though, if you haven't yet experienced Emmanuel Live, we encourage you to go to our website, eclife.org, to check out our service times and locations so that you can experience Emmanuel in person or through our online campus. If this message blesses you and you'd like to support the ministry financially, again, you can go to eclife.org and click on the Giving tab and choose Online Campus at your campus. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope this message will be an encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. Well, good morning, Emmanuel Church. How are you feeling today? <clears throat> I know it's only 9.20 in the morning, but uh, I hope that you're excited to be here, and I hope that you're ready to continue to have an interaction with God and receive from God. If you're brand new today, this is your first time at any one of our locations, whether you're joining us at our Banta campus, our Franklin campus, our Garfield Park campus, our Seymour campus, if you're joining us in our online campus here at Greenwood or one of our e-microsites, we want to give it up for you. Can we give it up for all of our first time guests today? Thank you for accepting someone's invitation. If you're not brand new, welcome back. Last week, we started a series called The Sixth Sense. And what we said last week is that God has given us our five senses, taste, touch, feel, smell, hearing, you know, all that good stuff, to kind of navigate the physical realm. And that's how we live our lives. We have jobs, we raise families. We do all the things that we do because we use our five senses to navigate the physical world. What we said last week is, what if there was another realm outside of the physical realm? What if there was a spiritual realm? What if there was an unseen realm with, that is just as real as the physical realm? Did you know the Bible says, the Apostle Paul says, that we are to walk by faith and not by sight? In other words, there's another world that we are supposed to live in and dwell in, in fact, even thrive in, that the five senses really do not help us to navigate which means there must be a sixth sense that we must develop in order to navigate that unseen realm. Jesus said one, one time, above all else, I want you to seek the kingdom of God. Above all else, first and foremost, and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. He gave us a prayer one time. Jesus gave us this, the, the Lord's prayer. It's not the Lord's prayer. It's, it's our prayer. We pray it, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom, say it with me, Come, your will be done on earth as it is, is done in heaven. What does that mean? That means that we are to be invoking and praying for and trying to live in this idea of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It's the unseen realm of God's activity. It's where God dwells. And God invites you into the kingdom of God. He calls it eternal life. Jesus called it abundant life. Last week we started by saying this in your notes, that God wants to give you this life. Life in the kingdom, spiritual life, not just physical life, but abundant life. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that you might have life, Zoe life, not just physical life, but spiritual life, and have it abundantly, have it to the full, have it to the max, have life that is overflowing with things like joy and peace and meaning and significance and purpose and inner strength and the ability to live above temptation and the ability to forgive those who hurt you powerful divine assistance available to you right now. That is the life that Jesus invites you and I into. But we also said last week that this life is opposed. It's God's plan for you to step into the kingdom. It's God's plan for you to live out this eternal, abundant life. But this life is opposed. There are forces working against you experiencing this life. We talked about the, the first one last week. If you missed it, you can catch it on YouTube. Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to block you from experiencing abundant life and eternal life. And he does that through deception. His strategy is to lie to you so that he will cut you off from the life of God. He wants to destroy your life. And I could preach a whole sermon on that again, and, and it would be helpful, but I did it last week and I can't do it again. Okay, so if you missed it, again, go back and watch that. We talked about how we need to take the truth of God's word, which is the sword of the spirit, and slice and dice and destroy the lies of Satan so that we can step into the kingdom of God. 
Now, today I want to talk to you about another obstacle, another force that is blocking us and stopping us from stepping into this thing called Zoe, abundant life, or life in the kingdom. And that is, if you're taking notes, the flesh. The flesh. What is the flesh? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, the apostle Peter writes these words. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners, that word just simply means temporary residence, okay? You're Earth is not your home. You're kind of visiting. Then he calls us exiles or foreigners. Like, hey, don't get too settled in because you're not going to live here forever. As sojourners, as exiles, here's what I want you to do. I want you to abstain from the passions of the, say it with me, the flesh. And this flesh does something. It, it, it's, it's doing something to us. What is it doing? It is waging war against your soul. Last week we said the context of your days is warfare. We have an enemy on the outside. And guess what? We have an enemy on the inside. We have found the enemy and the enemy is me. This flesh, whatever it is, is waging war in my soul flesh. What is the flesh? Well, based on lots of reading and the Bible and definitions and checking with theologians and cross-checking with different scriptures, here's the best definition that I could give you of what the flesh is. The flesh is the, simple, the sinful appetites in our body that feel natural but are wrong. That's what the flesh is. Does that make sense to you? <clears throat> based on your experience on earth thus far? Do you ever feel something that you want to do? You know it's wrong, but you want to do it anyway. Anybody? Is anybody human today? <laughs> the flesh. The flesh is, is waging war inside of our soul. It's like we are eating ourselves alive. It's like we're attacking ourselves, in a sense. It's almost like a, a civil war that's going on inside of our chest. Do you feel it? Are you aware of it? What is the flesh? Well, the Bible actually describes what the manifestation or what the activities of the flesh are. So if you're not quite sure what, uh, what it is, let's, let's look at it. In Galatians chapter 5, the apostle Paul tells us, he says, the acts of the flesh or the behaviors of the flesh are obvious. Everybody can see them. They're not hidden. And then he starts out with this first one, which I think is obvious to all of us today because we live in a completely sexualized world, sexual immorality. That's the first one on the list. What is sexual immorality? It's any sexual activity outside of the context of what the Bible defines as marriage between a husband and a wife. Anything outside of that, adultery, cheating, hooking up, Tinder, blah, 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 pornography, masturbation, all that stuff falls into the category of sexual immorality. Impurity, debauchery, or lustful desires, and he switches from sexuality to idolatry, which is looking to God for anything, looking to, to, to anything other than God for what only God can do. That's idolatry. Money, possessions, a person, witchcraft, hatred. We see a ton of that today. All you gotta do is get on Twitter, right? All you gotta do is get on social media, see hatred, like just pouring out of people. This is the works of the flesh. They're obvious, they're everywhere. Discord, we see that. Divisions, jealousy, fits of rage. You ever see those videos of people in the airports? Oh my gosh. It's hard to watch. People are raging with anger today. What is that? That is the acts of the flesh. He continues, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, a lot of division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And here's why he puts this in there. This is not an exhaustive list. He could have put in there Passive aggressive behavior, manipulation, uh, being overly sensitive, overly worried. He could have talked about uh, uh, on and on and on and on. Like the, the acts of the flesh are obvious to everywhere. And they're waging war against our soul. Now, if you're a believer today, how many believers we have here today? Anybody a believer, believer in Jesus? Okay, not everyone's a believer. That's okay. We're glad you're here. Our hope is you become a believer. In fact, you'll have an opportunity today to become a believer or disciple of Jesus. But if you're a believer today, you also have something called the Spirit inside of you, the Holy Spirit. Upon belief, when we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within every single believer. And the Spirit comes into us, and the Spirit sort of melds or meshes or, or combines himself with your spirit to make a different spirit, to make 
one spirit. Oh, if you think about it like this, when you're, when you're making tea, any, any tea people out there? Take a tea bag, you have hot water, you put the tea bag in the water. Now you have something totally different from a tea bag and water. You have tea. It's, so in a sense, that's what happens to you and I when we place our faith in Christ. The spirit comes to live inside of you, and now there's something different. There's the unique you, the you that you're supposed to be. And so you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But at the same time, and I wish this wasn't so, I wish it wasn't so, at the same time, the flesh doesn't go away. Don't you wish it would go away? Anybody else? I wish it would go away. It doesn't go away. So we've got the flesh inside of us, and we've got the Spirit. And in your notes, I wrote it like this. The flesh and the Spirit are at, say it with me, they are at odds. They're fighting. They don't like each other. There's a war going on inside. You ever see two rams in the wilderness kind of smash their heads together? It's like, why would they ever do that? That looks like it hurts so bad. Like we put helmets on to protect our brains. These guys are smashing their heads together. That's what's going on inside of you. Listen to how Paul describes it in Galatians chapter 5. He says, the sinful nature, which is another expression or another phrase for the flesh, it wants to do evil. Are you aware of that inside of your chest? There's a desire to do wrong, which is just the opposite of what the capital S, Holy Spirit, wants to do. And the Spirit gives you desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature, nature wants to do. And then he says this, watch. These two forces are constantly, say it with me, fighting each other. Constantly fighting each other. So that you are not free to carry out your good intentions or the intentions that the Holy Spirit has put inside of you. Wow. This is why we struggle. We struggle with saying, man, I shouldn't eat that ice cream and then we eat it anyway. I should go to the gym and we don't go. What's going on? Well, there's a civil war going on. I shouldn't lie about that. We lie about it. In fact, in Romans chapter 7, the apostle Paul says, I don't even understand myself. The things that I know I shouldn't do, I keep on doing. And the things that I know that I should do, I don't do. What is wrong with me? Have you been there? Because of this war, we tend to give in to the flesh. Even as Christians, we yield to the, fre- the flesh. We say yes to the flesh. And that produces something. It does something. Paul says, when we do that, we are not free to carry out the good intentions that we desire. How interesting. Freedom. Freedom is big to Americans. I, don't, I know we have friends watching overseas, but we love freedom here in America, right? Don't we? Yes? Anybody love freedom? Yes? I mean, you don't want to be a communist, do you? That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you don't want to be a communist. Anyway, this is a different, different sermon for a different day. We're into freedom. We like freedom in America. But I think what we've done is we've taken freedom and this idea of freedom in our culture today and we've kind of twisted it to be something it's not really supposed to be. Hang with me. Tell me if you haven't heard this definition of freedom in our world today, in our country today. Freedom, the ability to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, with who you want to do it with, as long as you want to do it. Have you heard that? This is America. America. Don't tell me I can't do that. Watch what I want to watch, do what I want to do, live my truth, be me, true, be true to yourself. Don't try to step on my territory and tell me I can't be true to myself. What happens if being true to yourself is wrong? What happens if being, living out your truth and you doing what you want to do when you want to do it hurts other people? See, there's got to be some sort of Rules, regulations, authority, control that is beyond you having the freedom to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, with who you want to do it with, as long as you want to do it. This is a bad idea. And it leads, Paul says, when we give in to the flesh, it actually says we lose freedom instead of gaining freedom. Interesting. It's as if Paul is saying there is a type of freedom that if you exercise it produces slavery. Hmm, now here's an idea. I wonder if Jesus taught that. Let's see. John chapter 8, verse 34. Everyone who practices sin becomes a, say it with me, slave to sin. Dallas Willard, when he was alive, if, if you don't know who Dallas is, man, I hope, I hope you grab some of his books, Divine Conspiracy, Renovation of the Heart, Spirit of the Disciplines. One of my favorite authors. 
He used to say when he was alive, you're free to choose, but you're not free to choose the consequences. You got to live with those. What did he mean? He meant the same thing Jesus meant when he said, look, you can take those pills. That's fine. You're free to do that unless you get caught by the police <laughs> if they're illegal pills. But you're not free of the consequences of taking those pills. Like, you're, you're free to smoke cigarettes. That's fine. You're free. There's, you could do it. It's legal. You're not free from the consequences of the addiction to nicotine. Like you're free. You're free to click on those websites. Like pornography is totally free in this country. I think it's insane, but it's, a, but it's free. You could do it. In the privacy of your home, you could look it on your phone, with your phone, but you're not free from the addiction of clicking again and again and again and looking for another video and another video. You see, you're free to choose, but you're not free from the consequences. There is a type of freedom that produces slavery. John Mark Comer, who's a pastor out, out west, said this, compulsion left unchecked turns into addiction, which is a form of slavery to desire. Is this making sense, yes or no? See, when we give into our flesh, it actually create, creates bondage, addiction. Years ago, I was uh, a kid, and I used to watch my mom um, make coffee every morning, and it, was, it smelled so good. And, you know, I used to ask her, can I drink it? No, I was like 12, whatever. Well, then she finally gave in, and I started drinking coffee. But I really wasn't drinking coffee. See, what my mom would do is she would add cream and sugar. Right? So what I was drinking was like... Um, basically a sugar drink. I was like, this is amazing. Well, all these years later, you know, I'm in my mid-40s now. I'm like, man, sugar's bad for you, and you shouldn't do it very much. Try to really try to limit it. It's like, so I'm going to go black, black coffee. I'm going to be one of those black coffee drinkers. You know what I'm saying? You know these people? Yeah, some of you raising your hand. Like you something. And you are, and, you are. and here's the thing, and, and here's the thing, you are, you are, you are something. Because I have, here's why, here's why I, here's why I got respect for you, because I have tried that so many times. Like, like, I got the French press at home. People say, oh, if you brew it correctly, it'll taste good. Like, I tried the, 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 the Euro press, the French press, the drip press. I got it all, bought it all. It's all terrible. <laughs> it's all bitter and terrible. So what, what I've come to realize is that I am addicted to creamer. That's the, I was free to choose and now I'm in bondage. And listen, there are other, vi there are other vices in my life I am too ashamed to admit on this platform. It's because that's the nature of how freedom works. When you give in and give in and give in, well then the, the byproduct of that is a slavery to desire. Some of you are there today, and there is something you wish you could stop, but you can't. Because you've done it, and you've practiced it, and you've done it, and you know it's bad, and you know it's wrong, whether it's gambling, or spending, or, or fits of anger. You're so used to losing your temper, and the people around you have made space for you to do it, you keep getting away with it, and now you can't stop losing your temper. The works of the flesh destroys your life. So what's the solution to this? Like I'm, 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 I'm trying to always figure stuff out. Like what do you do about this? And how do you work yourself out of this? Make sense of this? Change your life? Well, it turns out that the answer is so simple, but incredibly difficult to implement. And, and, and I'm going to tell it to you in my words, and then I'm going to show you how, where I got it from, from, from what Paul said in the book of Galatians. Check this out. What I, this is my phrase first. You must sow, farmer, farmer illustration here, you must sow to the Spirit. Remember, the Spirit lives inside of us, capital S. You must sow to the Spirit more than you sow to the flesh. Now, where do I get that idea? Listen to what Paul said in Galatians chapter 6. Watch this. For the one who sows to his own flesh reaps Corruption. Paul is the one that introduces this idea of farming and a field, and your soul is the field, and he says, if you plant seeds to the flesh, if you feed the flesh, if you give in to the flesh again, again, and again, if you give it content, if you give it seeds, you're going to reap, say it with me, corruption, decay, death. You're going to destroy your life. You're going to create addiction. But on the other hand, something different can happen. Watch this. The one who sows seeds, content, puts information, truth, goodness, righteousness into the spirit, that one will from the spirit reap what? 
eternal life. You know this word life is the same word Jesus used in John chapter 10? Zoe. Eternal life. Abundant life. Joy, peace, goodness. A clean conscience. Freedom from sin. See, what Paul is saying is like, your soul and my soul is like a field, a a farmer's field. And in that field, there are two types of soils. There's the spirit and there's the flesh. I wish it wasn't so, but that's the truth. And it doesn't matter who you are. You could be Billy Graham, who's not with us anymore, Mother Teresa, who's not with us anymore. But it doesn't matter who you are, they would tell you they have a mixture of soul and uh, of spirit and flesh. And, And... The crop that the farmer gets, the crop that you get, or what you're reaping, depends on what you are sowing to. In your notes, I wrote it like this. What grows in your soul depends on what you plant. Paul says, you, basically, he's saying, you're the one who's in control of who you are. You're the one who's in control of the crop that you're getting because you are the farmer and you are in control of the seeds that you're putting in the soil. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to get corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you're going to reap eternal life. Wow, that's powerful. What that means is that the current crop that you're getting, whatever it is, if you've got tons of joy and peace and patience and Kindness and gentleness and self-control and the strength to forgive and the strength to live free from sin. If you've got tons of fruit like that, you've been sowing good seeds. If, on the other hand, you have stress and anger and anxiety and you're seeking revenge and there's lots of jealousy and there's envy and, and there's discouragement and there's depression, you've been sowing seeds to the flesh. See, the crop that you have right now is a result of the seeds that you've been sowing. I watched a short little video the other day from a a podcast called The Pivot. It's a sports podcast, and they were interviewing Shaquille O'Neal, who's just uh, really one of my favorite people to to, to kind of follow. He's fun. He's just, he's big, (laughs) and uh, he's funny. Gosh, he's so funny. And they were talking to Shaq about his divorce, which happened, gosh, years ago. And he had never talked about it publicly. Maybe some of you saw this interview on The Pivot. Yep. And they were asking him questions. And the the, the question that the first guy asked him was, he was trying to let Shaq off the hook. He's like, yeah, everybody gets divorced. You know, it takes two to tango. You know, we know it's not all your fault, essentially. what. And Shaq was like, no, it's all my fault. Here's his quote. I was bad. He said, I had it all. I had this beautiful wife, gave me five kids. 76,000 square foot house. He said, I had it all. And then what happened was I got greedy. I was lost. And it wasn't enough. And so, so Shaq said, I didn't protect my vows. And he said, when you make lots of mistakes like that and you step outside of your marriage, it's hard to, it's hard to recover. It's all my fault took total responsibility. What was going on in Shaq's life? Where was he sowing? What was he sowing? You tell me. What kind, of, what kind of crop did he get? What was the fruit of his life? At one point, he was holding back his tears because what he said was, my favorite thing used to be to come home and, and, and hear five children run at me and jump on me and then, you know, bite them. He used to bite his kids, you know. He's, he, he said he's, he would turn into like the dog and he'd start chewing on them, which I think I did that too. <laughs> but now, guess what? He, he said, now there's no one there. I go to their bedrooms, they're not there. I go to the gymnasium. I know not all of us have gymnasiums in our house. Shaq does. <laughs> I go to the gymnasium, no one's playing. One man alone in a 76,000 square foot house. What's happening? You get get a crop based on what you were were sowing. What am I really saying here? Well, I'm trying to encourage you to be a better sower. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, it's not that hard. It's It's actually really simple. In your notes, I wrote it like this. Seeds are sown to the eyes and the ears. Seeds are sown to the eyes and the ears. How do you sow seeds to the spirit? Well, you got to be real careful about what's coming through the eyes 
and through the ears. See, the eyes and the ears are the portal into the mind. And the mind is the outer layer of the soul. You have the mind, the emotions, and at the center of who you are is this thing called your will, which is where you decide and make your choices. To cheat on your wife, to not cheat on your wife. To cheat on your husband, to not cheat. If you want to make great decisions at the core of who you are, then you have to have great seeds coming in through the eyes and through the ears. See, a lot of people don't realize that when you watch television, when you watch Netflix, when you watch the news, when you listen to a podcast, when you put on a song, those are all seeds. When you have a conversation with someone, that's a seed. When you have a memory, when you're, when you're dwelling on something in your mind, that's a seed. What are seeds? Seeds are images, music videos, podcasts, conversations with friends, Netflix, whatever you're watching there, movies, seeds, 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 seeds. And all the seeds that are coming in through our eyes and through our ears are entering our mind, and our mind is influencing our emotions, and our emotions are controlling our decisions. We are, 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 you, are you aware enough to know that you're an emotional creature? Like, we make all of our decisions, I would say 90-some percent of our decisions based on how we feel. We don't feel like going to the gym, we don't go. We don't feel like sticking to the diet, we don't stick to it. We eat the ice cream. Right? We don't feel like apologizing, we don't do it. I ain't apologizing, I feel like it. She should come to me. I'm offended. We don't do it. All right? We're emotional creatures. Our will at the center of who we are, the place where we choose, is at the mercy of how we feel. And how we feel is largely shaped by how we're thinking. And what we're thinking is shaped by the seeds that are coming in, see? How many of you do something right now in your life that you wish you didn't do, but you saw your dad do it? You saw your mom do it. She used to treat dad like that, so you treat your husband that way. You wish you didn't, but the seeds came in. Your dad drank alcohol, and now you drink alcohol because you watched from a little kid. You watched him do it, and now you do it. See, the seeds were being planted. He smoked, so you smoked. She did this, so you do it. This is the power of parenting, which is why it's so critical that parents get their act together because we're sowing the seeds into our children's lives. Let me wrap this up. Romans chapter 8, verse 6. You say, are you making this stuff up, Pastor Danny? Like, I don't know if I believe you. Check this out. The mind, remember we talked about the mind, right? Seeds come in through the ears and through the eyes. They enter the mind. The mind that is governed by the flesh. What is the flesh? It's the appetites and desires that feel right but are actually wrong. The mind that is governed by the flesh is, say it with me, is death. Death to your marriage, death to your health, death to your relationship with God. It cuts you off from abundant life and eternal life. But on the other hand, the mind that is governed, I love that word governed, controlled, led by the spirit is this thing called life and peace. And that's what we're after, life and peace. Well, how do we get there? We get there with different seeds. We plant different seeds into our mind through our eyes and through our ears and they produce a different crop. That's why Paul told us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we are transformed. We are changed into different people. This word transformed is this word metamorpho. We get our word metamorphosis, which we use to describe a caterpillar changing into a butterfly. The same thing is supposed to be happening with you. You're going from the person you are today into a Christ-like person. We are transformed by the renewing of our what? Our minds. Our minds are to be governed by the Spirit and our, when our minds are governed by the Spirit, it changes the way we feel, and it changes what we do. See, the sixth sense is really understanding how your soul operates and how your soul works so that you can get a different crop. Peter said, the desires of the flesh are waging war inside of your chest. And if you don't understand that war and the components and the pieces and how they all work together, you are toast. The mind governed by the flesh is death. If you are experiencing death right now in your life, it's because of the seeds that have been sown into your mind, through your ears and your eyes. Making sense? What am I saying? I'm really saying it's all your fault. I really am. Can we talk as adults here really quick? Like, stop blaming other people for the crop that your farm is producing. 
If you're depressed, it's because of the seeds. If you're discouraged, it's because of the seeds. If you're anxious, it's because of the seeds. If you're angry, men, listen to me. You guys struggle with this. If you have anger that's just simmering right under the surface and all someone has to do is cross you and it just explodes, that's your fault. Because you have been sowing seeds into that, creating that anger. Like, it's, it's, uh, we are the farmers. That's what Paul is saying. Now, I know I'm getting a little harsh right now, but it's the coach coming out of me. I'm, I'm a coach. Deep down inside, I'm a coach. So I, I love this idea because it puts the ball back in my court. Like, if I want a different crop, I got to sow different seeds. Yes? Amen? Somebody say amen. Yeah, that's, pre- that's good preaching right there, not because it's me. So. All my life, I have been trying to sow different seeds. Like, I get this. I got this 20 years ago. Like, I, like I, God revealed it to me, and I was like, okay, that's it. That's my, my, my soul is a soil, and I got to sow seeds and get, get better crop. So it occurred to me that, that I got to treat, mo- treat my soul the same way I treat my body. See, everybody has a diet. You guys have a diet? Right? Yeah. Chick-fil-A. <laughs> everybody. It's good stuff. We're supposed to eat vegetables, broccoli, and... Most, we're, in fact, science today tells us we're supposed to eat primarily vegetables. And that's the healthiest way to live. You really like that? I hate that. That sucks. <laughs> but that's what you're supposed to do to get the best results, to, get the, to feel the best, to look the best, for your bones and your muscles, all that stuff. But we don't do that. Why? Because we're fleshly creatures, right? But we have a diet. You have a diet. I have a diet. I could tell you what I eat on any given day. I'm pretty, pretty disciplined with that. And I get results from that. And you get results from that. In fact, the, your body looks the way it looks today because mostly if you talk to the experts, in fact, if you talk to the people who perform on stage, and I have some friends that do this for a living, not a living, but they do it professionally, they would tell you that it's, it's mostly diet. Well, you can go to the gym all the day long, but if you're eating poorly, you're not going to get results, right? Because you're, 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 you're feeding yourself the wrong foods. What if it worked the same way with your soul? Has it ever occurred to you that that you have a mental diet? Has that ever occurred to you? See, we live in a culture that they say, you're free to look at what you want to look at, take away. America, do what you want to do, when you want to do it, whoever you want to do it, as long as you want to do it, right? Look at, you can't tell me what I shouldn't look at. I know I can't. You're free to choose, but you're not free to choose the consequences. Mental diet. So we allow anything to come into our, our minds. Pornography, this, movies, all this different stuff, and podcasts, or terrible language, terrible content, off-color stuff, thing that's, things that not, that's not honoring to God. We just like, oh, well, I'm free. I'm, Amer- I'm an American. I can look at that. Okay, you can. But mark my words. Nothing enters into your mind through your eyes and your ears without having an effect. Nothing. Because it's a seed, and it's going into the soil, and it's going to produce something in your life. So I've just, it occurred to me that I need to create a healthy mental diet. It's so simple. Like I want a different crop. I, I, I want something, I want different results. I want joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5.22. I want that. I don't want stress and anxiety and anger and revenge and envy and jealousy and lust. And I don't, I don't want that stuff. Okay, I need different seeds coming into my mind through my eyes and my ears. Making sense? Somebody years ago, about 20 years ago, handed me a postcard. His name was Byron. He said, hey, memorize this verse. Let me show it to you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true and noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, watch this. Think about such things. My friend handed me that index card. He said, Danny, if you will make sure that your thoughts fall into all these categories, you're going to become a Christ-like man. I didn't really know what he was talking about. But I I felt like he knew more than I did, so I said, okay, I'll do it. So I memorized that verse, whatever's true, right, noble, pure, lovely, excellent, worthy of praise, think about these things. And I set my course to keep my mind, my mental diet on only things in those categories. I started getting results right away. I started to see a different crop. I started to see less anger, less lust, less, you know, jealousy, less envy. I started to see more gratitude. I started to see more joy. I started to see more peace. Almost immediately because I started to change the contents of the media and information and conversations. 
movies I was watching, music I was listening to. And I'm still doing that today. Let me give you a couple of practical examples of different types of seeds that you can sow. First of all, the word of God. Nothing like it. It's the best thing on planet Earth. I would trade nothing for it. (laughs) This book right here is the truth. And so I take it into my mind every single day. I was in it this morning, Psalm 130. You know what it says in Psalm 130? It says, God, if you kept a record of our sins, who could survive? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore we should fear you. Oh, this is exactly what I needed to hear this morning as I was preparing to come to church. Every single day the word of God shapes seeds, seeds, seeds going into the mind. Number two, uplifting music and media. Like what are you watching? What are you listening to? What are you watching on YouTube? What are you watching on Snapchat? Like, what is the content? These are seeds. Nothing enters your mind through the ears and eyes without having an effect on you. So be incredibly diligent with the content that's coming into your mind through the music that you're listening to and through the podcasts you're listening to and through the videos that you're watching. Number three, good books, good books. I am always reading two or three good books. I mean great books. You can pick them, and they're so cheap. I mean, you can go to Half Price Books and get one for like seven bucks, 10 bucks, 12 bucks. It could change your life. I'm talking about mere Christianity. I've seen it in in Half Price Books for like $8. That book changed my whole life. Books, there's so many great books out there. John Eldridge wrote a great book called Wild at Heart. His wife wrote a great book called... I can't remember. (laughs) There's so many great books by Dallas Willard. There's so many great books by John Maxwell if you're into leadership and personal development. Oh, read, 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 great books. And then lastly, solid friends. Who are the people in your life? And here's why. This is so important because the people in your life, believe it or not, through conversation, are placing seeds into your mind. With the stories they tell, with the jokes they tell, I was at the gym the other day, and this guy said, hey, you know, I'll tell you about this one time. I was at a, you know, I had to go to a house, and he, he was an EMT. He told me the stories, and I was, like, drawn in a little bit, you know, because it's kind of uh, interesting. And then I, I saw this, con- I saw the, con- I saw it going south, and I was trying to, <laughs> going towards the door, because I could tell this was not a good story. And I didn't really want to hear the end of it. I knew it was going to be bad. He said, oh, no, you got to wait to the end. I said, oh, I was trying to avoid. <laughs> sure enough, out of respect, I stayed there and I listened to it. And now I have this stupid image in my head that I can't get out because he finished the story. That's what people do. Bad jokes, horrible jokes, off-color jokes, things that are dishonoring to God. How many of you have something in your mind right now that keeps coming up that you saw a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, you wish you could forget about it, but you can't? How many? Raise your hand. Both my hands are up. And I'm jumping. It's like, dang it, I wish I never saw that. I wish it was never in there. I wish I never heard that. I wish it wasn't there because it's still having an effect on me in my life. Why? Because that's the way God made you. Seeds come into the eyes and the ears into the mind and they shape how you feel and they, they shape your decisions. At least now you know how your soul works. Like the sixth sense is understanding the spiritual side of who you are. You have a soul. And it's being shaped and influenced by the seeds that you're sowing. Jesus said this, everyone who practices sin becomes a slave to sin. Paul said when you give in to the desires of the flesh, you actually lose freedom to do the good intentions that you're designed to do. So here's my question today. I know I'm talking a lot, sorry. What seeds are you sowing? Be insane about the seeds. Like be crazy about the seeds, like watch them. Be super intentional about the ideas and images and videos and movies and the conversations that are coming into your mind through your ears and through your eyes because they're having an impact on you. They can either lead to corruption or eternal life. Now, as we wrap up, you know, a lot of preachers will say that this book teaches that Jesus came to this earth to die on a cross, to pay for your sins. He rose again three days later. So if you say this prayer, then you don't have to go to hell. When you die, you can go to heaven instead. And I believe every word that I just said. But a lot of preachers will tell you that that is the extent of the gospel. And I would 100% disagree. 
Yes, Jesus came to this earth to die on a cross. Three days later, he rose again to pay for your sin. Like your sin separates you from God and someone had to pay the price for that and you couldn't, so Jesus does it. Why? Because he loves you. He steps in as sort of this, this, this person who you know, pays the penalty or, 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 or pays the price so you can go free of your sin. And all of that is true and I believe it 100%. But you know what is, 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 is beyond that, and behind that, and above that, and below that? It's, it's, it's this idea that Jesus did that, not just to take you to heaven when you die, but so that you could experience joy, and peace, and meaning, and purpose, and significance. Some of you feel right now, you, f- you feel insignificant. You feel like your life is meaningless. There's no purpose to your life. It's because you're not stepped into, you're not living into the kingdom. Jesus came to die on a cross, yes, to forgive our sins, but so that you could be caught up in kingdom living where your life has meaning and purpose. Where you can live above sin and free from addiction and live above anxiety. Can you imagine? Some of you, you, you're longing to live a life without anxiety. It's right there. There's a, there's a, it's the offer is peace, rest of soul. That's why Jesus came. Yes, to forgive you of your sins, but to invite you into kingdom living. And if, you, if, if that intrigues you, if that's something you want, you don't really know how to work all the details, that's okay. I don't know how electricity works. I use it all the time. <laughs> you don't have to know how it all works, and you just have to know that Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for you to pay for your sins, and he invites you into eternal life. Will you accept that invitation? I'm going to pray a simple prayer. It's a prayer of faith. If you feel led to right now, whatever campus you're at, if you're watching online, one of our e-microsites, You bow your head, you close your eyes, you pray this prayer, you're gonna step into kingdom living today. Will you pray with me? If you feel led to, just say this to him. Dear Jesus, I place my faith in you today. I know I'm a sinner and I've broken your laws, undeserving of your love, but I believe you reached out in grace to forgive me. I believe you came to this earth to die for my sins, to pay the penalty, to ransom me, to make me your child. So I reach out to you today, ask you to cleanse my heart, cleanse my soul, wash me. I put my trust in you. I ask you to be my savior. I'm stepping into life with you, kingdom living. Fill my heart with joy. Remove the anger and the anxiety and the stress. Replace it with your peace as I reach out to you. Turn my life around. Change me from the inside out. And help me from this day forward to sow to the Spirit, to plant different seeds through my eyes and through my ears into my mind. I love you. And I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, our church wants to celebrate with you, all of our campuses. Amen. What we've done for you, if you just trusted Christ, we put together a little box called our saved box. Inside this box, there's some information about our church, a Bible with a reading plan to get you started in the truth of God's word. There's some information about small group, baptism, and there's also a coffee mug in here to say congratulations. If you would text the word SAVED to 65248, You can grab one of these at your campus at the information desk. If you're watching online, uh, just give us a little bit more information there and we'll send one of these to you in the mail. One more time, church, can we give God glory? Amen. You are responsible. You are the farmer. If you want a different crop, plant some different seeds. That's my challenge to you today. Will you pray with me and then I'm gonna hand things off to the local teams. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the writings of, of, of the Apostle Paul, the clarity that he's given us. Jesus, thank you for teaching us that if we give in to the flesh, we actually will become slaves. Give us enough wisdom today 
to be better farmers, to plant different seeds, that we might experience freedom, that we might experience the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right now, I'm going to hand things off to the local teams. God bless you guys. See you next week. Bring a friend.